Okay, so welcome everybody for coming along to our webinar this afternoon and welcome to Pete, Pete Mosley, who's going to be telling us all about our Art of the Possible cards today. Hi, hi Pete, nice, nice to see you. Hi, hi, thanks for inviting me along. Good to hi. be here. No, it's great to have you here. Now, Pete was one of our first um, uh, creative partners to join us in DeckHive. So DeckHive is, as you know, the new platform whereby you can use uh, virtual cards online. Um, and Pete's Art of the Possible Cards were one of the very first sets of cards that we had up on the platform. And so today I'm going to be talking to Pete and asking him a little bit about his background and background to the cards and how they can be used. So hopefully giving you all a greater insight into the best ways to get the most out of the Art of the Possible Cards. So I don't know, Pete, whether you wanted to start with telling us a little bit about you and your background um, before we get into the cards. Yes, I mean, it's been an interesting kind of evolution. Before I trained as a coach in 2007 with Barefoot Coaching Limited. Um, funnily enough, I now teach on the, I mean, the flagship course that they have. Um, but I originally started my career as a fine artist and worked as an artist in education for a very long time before being trained as an arts consultant by Arts Council and then Crafts Council, uh, and then moving into the whole business of mentoring people in their small creative businesses. And I did that for 15 years. And during that period, my kind of creativity, other than writing, me, the notion of me drawing became dormant, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the iPad came along and I switched on my iPad and found all these incredible drawing tools and just got totally seduced by it and started doodling and it really was doodling for the purposes of um, illustrating my blog and, and stuff like that. But when we get into the, sh uh, the screen share in a moment, I'll, I'll talk through that kind of process of, of evolution really. Mm -hmm. um, but I work with Barefoot now, I've got a reputation for working with, I've earned a reputation rather for being a specialist and working with quiet people um, introverts, and actually the introversion bit is a bit of a misnomer because I don't just work with introverts. I work with people who, who are either quiet by nature or who have become quiet for some mm. other reason and, and that whole cluster of stuff around why don't people speak up freely and how do they get around the notion of people at work telling them to behave like extroverts when in fact they might not be an introvert and it's a kind of false, false mm. flipping that people are looking for. Um, in truth, I work with anyone uh, who happens to be drawn towards my kind of quiet way of doing things. Mm. So it's probably yeah. good now if I pop into the slide share and just tell the story. Yeah, I do, do. I, it's, I think it's lovely that you sort of came full circle back to your art. Uh -huh. It must be really satisfying to be able to sort of combine those things now in what you do. Yes, it is. And it's become more considered, I think, you know, rather than doing the drawing as a kind of byproduct, the drawing actually drives some of the things that I do along um, mm -hmm. because people get absorbed with the drawings and it becomes both a means to get to know to, as a, something they can use. But some of the drawings are, in fact, coaching tools as well in themselves. Um, uh, so it gives people a way in on a number of levels, really, to thinking about this stuff yeah so well I'll, it will just, it will be good to hear more so yes please do yeah, do you yeah, want to yeah, share yeah, your I'll screen and you've got the, some slides the screen share now so yeah uh, art of the possible cards um they, they were called the art of the possible cards because um, the book that i wrote was called the art of shouting quietly and it just seemed apt to call them the, the art of something um this is where it started really, just this very, very simple drawing was one of the first drawings I did on the iPad and I was trying to, it was a post that I'd written on public speaking and people getting over their anxiety, threshold of anxiety around public speaking. And it was this just the notion of a quiet little mouse character um, getting up on stage for the first time and, and receiving a nice response to it and uh, that kind of focused people in on what the post was about. Um, and then a, a subsequent blog post which, which got into a bit of content. I was using the drawings um, to lead the content, not to the seed of honest potential. There's a, a, a whole section in some of the talks that I do around people finding a seed of potential that's been kind of lost within themselves or covered up 
and then often round about midlife, discovering that there's something else there as yet underutilized um, that they can work with. Um, and, and what happened was um, that these slides became the backbone of a TED talk, a TEDx talk that I delivered. And I used the slides very much to underpin the content and the sequence of the talks. So it's a whole section of what success means that I use an awful lot. It was TEDx Derby 2014. Um, an interesting event for me because as an introvert, it, it was the first time that I'd got involved in doing something that to me at the time was that prominent. I was terrified. So I was kind of living through my own process of um, a, confronting the fear of public speaking. And, and of course, these things are semi-autobiographical, aren't they? You, know, you end up using your own internal dialogue in the work you do with people and to recount the tales of how you got over specific things and, and tackled them and worked with them. So the cards very much developed from that. Uh, and of course, the book followed on very shortly after the TED talk because I took the themes in the TED next talk and developed those into the book, The Art of Shouting Quietly. Uh, which has sold, uh, it's really surprised me. I mean, it's sold in 15 or 16 countries across the world. Mm. And there's a, a huge audience of quiet people across the globe, uh, which was lovely. It was a big surprise. I published it with a crowdfunding campaign. And one of the side effects of the crowdfunding campaign was it, even before I'd finished writing it, it had sold in, in that number of countries and had or was beginning to generate quite a wide audience. Mm. Well, love, lovely um, feedback for your focus yeah to get that response absolutely absolutely uh, and uh, to be honest uh, you know the the response that I got actually helped me fine-tune the focus of the writing with the audience for the book before it was actually written and published uh, crowdfunding is such an interesting thing to do you get huge amounts of feedback during the process of doing it so this is one of the cards that is in itself a, a forwards away from coaching exercise, you know, what do I want more of, what do I want less of, and, and using this card with clients can often unlock some forward motion for them. Um, another card about the cycle of values, empathy, trust, relationship and loyalty, which I use with people that are trying to understand how they build a series of touch points with customers around a product or their creativity or their coaching or, or whatever. Um, so the cards unpack uh, often more than a traditional picture card or photo card will do. Um, uh, and again, um, this one, you can see they're becoming more, more sophisticated the more time I'm working on them. Um, I, I am intending to republish the physical card deck uh, later in the year. Uh, and it will be updated with a lot of new images, so there'll be more cards in the deck, and there will be more cards on the deck hive deck as they get uh, added on um, with with more sophisticated imagery. So um, I think it would be good to just talk a little bit about situations in which I've used the cards. Um, I ran a coaching cafe. I hired a local cafe for an afternoon and and um, publicized tickets on Eventbrite and people came along and we used the cards as a focus for speed coaching. And I'm going to show you exactly the process by which we did the speed coaching when we move on to the deck hive deck. Um, but basic, basically I spread all the decks around on the table. People were able to use, uh, pick up the cards as a, a starting point to conversation. So they went from simply being an icebreaker to being a coaching tool that moved them along within the course of the afternoon um, into making some progress and decisions for themselves. Uh, and I've also used them in, uh, this is an academic uh, situation. This is a group of senior managers at um, Nottingham Trent University who wanted to use the cards uh, for ideas generation. And one of the things that they were particularly struggling with was getting student engagement within the digital realm and using all of the digital resources that the university had to offer. And again, we used the cards, posed the question, how do we get students to engage? And they each picked a card that suggested to them some solution or some aspect of a solution 
to that particular problem. And by using the kind of metaphorical quality that the cards have, they arrived at some really imaginative ideas um, as to how to do that. Uh, this is a, a different angle of the same event. There were about 16 people at the event, all working in groups of four. But they do provide a lovely focus if you're group coaching to do stuff like this and, and simply posing a question and asking people to choose cards that suggest an answer. Sounds ever so simple, but it works really well. Well, in your yeah. experience, why, why does it work so well? What is it about it? I think pictures and metaphor, it, it, it unlocks an extra layer of thinking. I mean, the, the, the word metaphor is about carrying ideas across, you know, it's, it's um, and I think pictures and metaphor carry, help carry ideas from the subconscious into the conscious mind. And you find yourself thinking about things that are otherwise hidden. Um, and the kind of auditory questioning or auditory exploration alone doesn't uncover those things. It just adds an extra layer in to all sorts of people of different uh, preferences in terms of what makes meaning for them. I mean, we used to talk about learning styles. That's kind of been debunked, but it's still very much about what creates meaning for people in the moment and having something pictorial as well as something auditory to work with uh, makes a big difference, I think. Mm. And it's the telling of those stories, I think, in in, uh, in our experience and the, the group coaching situation where people can mm. compare and contrast the yeah. images they choose and, and the words they put to that. I can yeah. imagine that's really powerful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, and what it does is it helps people generate kind of very rapid lists of ideas, but it's better than brainstorming. And then the cards were put away and then they, they then worked on the ideas and prioritized them. Um, we used a, a thinking environment technique. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the thinking environment pioneered by Nancy Klein uh, in her book, Time to Think, um, where uh, rather than the normal uh, somewhat uh, unmanageable process of meeting and gathering, uh, kind of managing the energy energy in the room between quiet and, and lively or souls. The thinking environment manages the time and the input in such a way that everybody gets an equal, say, in an equal amount of time. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a powerful session really around that. I can imagine. Mm. I think that's us at the end of the, yeah, I just got a few samples. This was, a, you know, using cards in a cafe to suggest some ideas. Somebody was talking about how do I, uh, how do I get somebody to help me with an idea? And I'm saying, well, why don't you just write cheeky letters to people? And we, we worked around this notion of the cheeky letter card. Um, uh, so that's the book and just some random cards um, picked out there with it. So I'm just going to come out the, the share for now. Um, and I suppose that's an appropriate point if anybody's got any questions, really. Yeah, has anyone got anything so far on how, how Pete got to where he got to and anything about the background to the cards? If you feel free to unmute and just ask the question or alternatively put it in the chat. Uh, if you prefer whichever can i just ask pete to um repeat again when the physical cards will be available because i contacted you a few months ago about buying some because i think they're amazing and uh -huh. you said to me that um there weren't any so yeah. i just want to diarize yeah um i'm anticipating that it will be towards christmas time or possibly slightly thereafter I'm in the middle of writing another book at the moment, and my deadline for getting that published is November. It has to be out on Kindle by November. So I'm having to be really careful about how I manage my time. Forgive me if they're not available, bang on the button in December, but that's my rough thinking. So um, is, it, is it all right to send a new an email at the back end of November to just ask where of progress course. is? Is that yeah, all right? Yeah. yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, wh when it's getting close to the time, I'll do my usual thing about letting people know on LinkedIn. And I get quite vocal about these things when they're coming up. So it'll also be visible on there. Mm -hmm. Fab, thank you. And, and as you say, you'll update Deck Hive when that happens as well, won't you? So we'll have the uh, mm. additional cards on Deck Hive yeah. available. Yeah, absolutely. And any other questions from anyone at the moment? Could I ask a question? Yes, Julia. 
Hi, so I'm sitting in my car because I have a two o'clock appointment. So <laughs> I've driven here to sit in the car. Pete, I'm really interested in to what extent, if any, do you use these with senior leadership or management teams? I, I hear you say that you use them to help people to coach each other. And I can mm. see that that would apply. But I'm wondering around working with teams around strategy, priorities, goal setting and everything. Do, do they have a role in that? Yes, absolutely. People use them for, for ideas generation and strategizing with things. I mean, I showed a slide a minute ago of me working with a senior management team at Nottingham Trent Uni to do that. And it would work with almost any team. Um, to be honest, I, I, when I first started out on this path, I really wondered whether senior leaders and managers might find the whole notion of using picture cards a bit kind of touchy-feely. And actually, when they see the deck, they get really absorbed in the, the real variety of stuff that's on there. It's very different to traditional coaching cards. So they kind of jumped into the task uh, much more easily and willingly um, than I imagined. But I, I do, I use them with, with you know, CEOs, uh, quite happily spread them out on the desk and, uh, and folk really dive in, you know, really roll their sleeves up and get on with it. Thank you. I, I, would, I wouldn't introduce them at random. Uh, as in the normal coaching process, I, I'd introduce them as a tool that might be possible uh, to use in this situation. And that I would like to explain them and show them the, to the, the tool and uh, show them how it works and, and co-create the permission to use it in that space. Uh, and then I would move forward. I wouldn't just randomly throw a pack at people and say, we are going to do this because that, that's destined not to work. Well, maybe now's a good time then, Pete, for you to show us, talk us through some yeah. of the ways in which you have used the cards. Sure. So I need to um, just make sure that I can get the deck hive screen up. That's not sharing, is it? No, not at the moment. No. Okay. So. I'm having to switch between uh, Safari and. And Chrome. Um, I did it a minute ago. You did. It all worked perfectly yeah. in our rehearsal. Yeah, a few absolutely. Ago. <laughs> just bear with me. I'll get there in a moment. So as we go through the next part, while Pete's just getting uh, Deck Hive up, then please do feel free to add more questions into the chat as we go. Or again, Pete's happy to take questions um, on the fly. So do do speak up if you've got a question yeah. to ask. There we go. We've got it now, Pete. We can okay. see them. So what I've done here in Deck Hive is I've set up uh, three sessions. A session is basically um, a place where you can use cards in different ways with different people. And you can set up new sessions with every single person you work with or every group you work with. And I've actually set up and stored three sessions here. And I'm going to share the content from each of those sessions. You can go back and reopen them. You can archive them and do what you want with but very often at the beginning of a coaching session with somebody using Deck Hive, the cards in Deck Hive, I would simply show them all the cards. And it's possible to put them all out on one table and to scroll through the whole deck. People want to see specific cards and look at them in more detail. It's possible to actually zoom in on the cards and, and get more detail in that way for them. Um, and what often happens is that during that process of, of um, just getting them to scan through the cards, they'll alight on something that takes the fancy. Um, you know, it might be uh, something to do with the confidence cycle that they're looking at. And we might say, well, you know, shall we go into the deck and take that card and do some work around it? Uh, and they'll go, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, and then we would move to the next stage of opening up another session uh, and giving them the opportunity to work in that way. So what so, sort of what sort of question would you ask Pete at, at this early stage when you're showing people the whole deck? How do you sort of instruct them to view the deck? <laughs> I, I don't really, if I'm honest, I'll let the images do the work for magic. 
you know, and the, the, there might be some, ooh, ooh uh, let me have a look at that one, please. And, and you know, you're kind of moving around um, uh, and focusing in on certain areas of the, the process um, so they can see the thing that they're interested in. And this, this is quite a, a common one that people pick, you know, it's to do with purpose and direction and all the rest of it. And they'll go, yeah, yeah actually, let's have a go at working with that one. Okay. Um, and then I would clear this table away mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just physically going to do what I would actually do in the yeah. session, which is to leave this session, um, come back and open another session. Um, and on this one, you can see that I pre-prepared uh, some post-it notes there. One just says simply pick a card. The other are, uh, it's a post-it note that the client or I can type into uh, and kind of take their thoughts. Just do that in real time. Um, and when we get to the pick a card stage, we would then open up the tray. And bearing in mind they've already had a look at the cards, we can then quite rapidly scroll up and go, well, you wanted that one. Let's drag that one out onto the deck uh, and have a look at that close the deck uh, and then we can begin thinking about this this card um get it a bit bigger uh, and then i would go into the questions now the these questions are um they're on the the profile page on deck hive uh, if you're using this set of cards you can find that uh, the instructions for using this exact set of questions on the profile page with the cards in deck hive and what I've done is I've, I've laid the questions out, but I've covered them up. So you don't see the questions until I'm ready to explain them. So they've chosen this card. And what I'll do is then go to the next card question, which is what drew you towards that card? So that just begins a conversation about, you know, what, um, what drew you towards that card? Why do you think it jumped out at you? And they'll usually be quite a, a longish bit of narrative around there. And it's often stuff to do, well, you know, I'm, I'm really unsure about my direction. I don't actually know what I'm on the planet to do. I've thought about it enough. Um, I aspire to being a purpose-driven individual. Uh, maybe, um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking about. That's what drew me towards the card, which would lead to the next question, which is what thoughts does that bring to mind? Well, they then usually go a bit quiet for a while and say, well, yeah, I need to think about that. What am I on the planet to do? Um, really, I want, you know, I want to work on my legacy idea. I like the notion that I might put something out into the world that, that outlasts me. You know, whatever you do dies with you. Um, what you do for others lives on and is remembered. Uh, the Arnold Payne quote. Um, so I want to do some. I want to do something big. I want to to do a talk. I want to do a book. I want to do something that really has a meaning to it. And okay, let's ask the next question then. Um, of those thoughts, which do you really want to pay attention to? And they'll then sift through um, those thoughts and go. Well, actually, I want to focus on the book, you know, and we might then have a, a conversation about what's involved um, around the notion of them publishing a book or doing a Kindle or creating an online course even to, to move the idea forwards. Meanwhile, they're going to be taking notes uh, and they can use the post-it notes to type those things into. Uh, and if they want to, they can just add more post-it notes. Or, uh, and if they, again, they can just change the color of the notes, so they can have different notes in different colours according to what they're uh, focusing on. And then we might move to another question, which is, OK, you've done some thinking around the book. What comes to mind as a goal or an action to move you forward? Uh, and then we'd be moving into the kind of goal setting, defining actions, thinking about accountability, maybe uh, this sequence very much follows the kind of grow model, really, of coaching. Um, 
but it works really well in short spaces of time. I've done speed coaching sessions with this uh, in public spaces where people have got like 15 or 20 minutes with me. And by using this, uh, this really speedy process, you can get them somewhere really quite quickly um, if they're in the right place in their mind to do it. So that's just an example of, of one way that you can use the cards. Incidentally, you can use both the digital and the, the real cards to do this. The same thing works. So I'm just going to come out of the session. That sounds like a really great activity to get somewhere quite fast with people in terms yeah, of getting yeah. them to focus. Yes, absolutely. I'll go back into the slideshow in a moment, but I thought again it might be useful just to see if there's any thoughts or feedback or questions around that. Again, feel free to unmute and just ask if you've got any questions. Yeah. No. no. Okay. Not yet. So what I'm going to do next is describe how they can be used to help people develop a personal narrative and to develop a narrative that may exist for them, but they're not aware of yet. You know, something that might be deeply troubling them but they haven't quite got their head around how to think about it yet. So the next thing I'm going to show is how you can use that. Um, and it just spontaneously creates um, solutions for them. So I'm just going to go into this one. So uh, this one is called The Musician's Story. And this is, it's, it's like a real life mini case study. Uh, and it was a young professional musician um, who was struggling a bit. And we did some work with the cards. And I said, well, look, you know, pick three cards and then we'll examine how those cards are connected. Now, I'm not telling them what cards to pick. Uh, one of my instructions would be, you know, don't spend too much time, just spontaneously pick three cards that seem to work for you. Uh, and these are the three cards that he picked out, the confidence card, the conversations card, and the cash flow cards. And it didn't take long, really, to just unlock what was really troubling him. He wasn't earning very mon much money from his music, um, uh, and he really needed a coaching conversation around how to do that. Now, he'd got to the point, subconsciously, and now coming into conscious uh, uh, awareness, that actually he needed to be brave enough to talk to an awful lot more people about what he did. And therefore that was also linked back to the confidence card. So we're looking at a number of different aspects of this person's working life. And, and we can use that then to structure a coaching session. So where do you want to begin? Do you want to begin by just telling me a little bit more about your financial situation? And what is it you need in order to resolve that aspect? of the problem of can you put a figure to it have you got an aspirational weekly or monthly income from that uh, and then we can have a conversation around who it is that he particularly needs to talk to you know are there agents he needs to talk to or producers or venues or whatever uh, and that that creates a list of bullet points around that for a coaching conversation to be based in and then we come back to the basic thing of you know tell me more about what you mean by your requirements in terms of your own confidence. Where are you confident already? Where are you not confident? Are there specific examples you can give where you hit a threshold of anxiety or some self-limiting beliefs around talking to other people? And can we begin to define what's really happening there and what the blocks are? Because if we can identify the blocks, we can use a coaching conversation to begin to identify the pathways to resolve them. And I can maybe give you some coaching exercises um, around that. So we, what we've developed there is a narrative. And this narrative has probably been going around in his head and, and troubling him for some quite some time before he came for coaching. You know, that's why people choose to come for coaching, really, because they're ready to change something. They might not be terribly aware of what it is. But by using the cards, we can get all of this stuff into play, get it on the table metaphorically and literally uh, and begin to move the thinking around uh, and get some mobility of thinking by using the coaching cards. So I'm just going to leave that session now.
uh, I'm going to stop the share and come back into the room. So um, you know, I, I'm just I'm just showing some basic ways in, and and you know, as a coach or a therapist, I'm sure you could discover many other ways of using these um, it, just to unlock thinking. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? How some you know that relatively simple process, but with good questions and a good mm. range of images, how you can start to unlock a lot of information. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, anybody that's used to using picture cards will realise that the power of that stuff already. Um, but the the art of the possible, there's a whole range of topics in, in, embedded in the cards that are starting points that link into people's natural internal narrative. Um, and it doesn't actually need that much work at the beginning of the session because they will be drawn towards certain images and not others. Mm -hmm. Astrid, I noticed you've got your hand up. Yeah, sorry, I unmuted too fast last time. So, um, <laughs> really, really lovely, Pete, as ever. I'm the fangirl for your cards. When you're working with people through this remote medium, mm -hmm. how do you find they respond to the cards? Obviously, face to face, there is the tactile experience. There is the human experience. Yeah. And Deck Hive is a smashing um, piece of kit, and obviously I've had a bit of a play with it. But there is still that remove. But the intimacy of the conversations that you're having mm -hmm. triggered by the cards still remain. So how are you balancing that? Uh, I mean, that's, it's, a, it's a wonderful question, Astrid, and it's a question that many, many people are asking themselves at the moment because we've all been used to working live. We've all been used to going out and working with training groups and um, with Barefoot even, we, we ran all of the postgraduate certificate courses in the room with people and were terribly worried when that got taken off and put online as to whether folk would still engage. And the truth is that people are loving, it's different. You, ha you don't have that intimacy. You don't have that, the dynamic of being in the room with people, but actually you get some other stuff that you don't get in the room. Um, just pertaining to quiet people in the room, you've always got that struggle with quiet people as to whether or not they're going to step forward and, and come out with what they've got in their head and what they've been thinking about for a very long time. Uh, in a Zoom room, if you stru structure it completely and, and kind of compensate for that, you can get engagement from people that aren't normally the ones that step up and engage. So it's not the same thing. It doesn't have that wonderful dynamic to it that working live does. But what it does do is give you a way into people's thinking and feelings and um how they are in the world that they might not have given up so readily were they in a live environment is that okay brilliant thank you pete that's yeah it's really interesting to compare and contrast those differences and i, I think that's important isn't it we're not doing exactly the same thing online it's there mm. are different different benefits mm. are there yeah. any other questions at this stage No, brilliant. Okay, I'm just thinking, Michelle, the, I mean, from my point of view, um, what I see is people not just working one-to-one -one with these cards, but working with the cards in groups. And of course, it's eminently shareable in a, a group coaching situation because it, 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 even to, in going into breakout groups, each breakout group can have a different deck to work with. Mm -hmm. So it adds a, a huge amount of flexibility to that. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, if you're uh, teaching or working with coaching, the problem is if you try and use physical props, say you're trying to do constellations, work with physical props, um, they're out of view of the camera, you know, or you're, you're maybe doing some relationship mapping, it's all out of view of the camera. But with Deck Hive, you can create your own cards, really, to take on the characters or the objects that you might use in that relationship mapping. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and do it a different way and it mm. still works 
Yeah, that, that's the advantages now on Deck Hive that everybody can see what everyone else is, mm. is seeing and everyone yeah. still gets their own, own deck to work with. And, and yes, in groups, that, that's quite important. So how, um, I was about to ask you about that actually, because you showed in your slides uh, instances of where you've been using the cards in groups. Can mm. you talk us through a little bit more about that? I mean, any tips for people about the best ways to use them in groups or anything like that? I think, to me, coaching cards are one of the most powerful things you can do, use with people, both as individuals and with groups. Anything that involves movement, anything that's kinetic, anything that's got more than one kind of uh, modality attached to it, by that I mean auditory, kinesthetic, touchy, obviously you can't lick them and you can't smell them, so that, that's dropped out, but you've got the rest to play with. Um, but if you want to get people's buy-in, you need to create a psychologically safe space for them to work in, in order to get them to feel they want to take the next step forward and actually involve themselves in the session. So in the initial contracting that you might do, I would always check that they're happy to go there, you know, and they're happy to work with these things and that they see them as a, a positive way forward, or at least that they're willing to try them out for the very first time. I mean, my caveat in using any coaching tool is that at any point you can screw it up into a metaphorical ball and throw it over your shoulder if it's not the right tool. So uh, given all that, yeah, absolutely. But I've never had anybody say, no, I don't want to do that because we've, we've normally just got there by a process of deduction anyway. Mm. So it's about timing timing isn't it and yeah. introducing them at the right time and then positioning them exactly yeah. yeah i can see that ivy's got a question about how can you use the cards to find meaning and purpose um with it, for people to find meaning and purpose in their lives okay that's a really good <laughs> really good question that's a big question what, <laughs> what is the what is the what, what's the meaning of life question i think the other thing is you know people talk about purpose and meaning and focus. And the danger is when people say purpose, meaning and focus to you, and you've got your coaching hat on, your brain then, and the neuroscience shows this, your brain starts making predictions about what that might be. And the danger is because you as coach, because your brain's doing that, you end up making suggestions to folk that actually aren't anything to do with what's happening in the room. It's to do with who you are and your past experience and all the rest of it. Um, there, there's a wonderful book by Lisa Feldman Barrett called Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain and another one called um, The New Science of Emotions, which has really shaken up a lot of how we think and feel about all this stuff within our coaching process. Um, so how can you use the... I'll get back to answering the question again. How, how can you use the cards to find meaning and purpose? The answer is that you put the cards out there and people by some strange and magical process will gravitate towards the images that have meaning for them. And they may choose 15 or 20 to begin with and you can just discard all the rest. And then you look at those and you think, well, okay, where's the focus here? What's the story that's emerging in the connection between all these cards? And they may shuffle them up and take a few more away. But you'll usually end up with a handful of cards that really begin to define what purpose means to them. And for some folk that might be doing work that's around environmental things. For others, it might be a spiritual thing that they're working on. For some, it might be around mental health. You know, what the cards do is help them just sift their ideas and dig more stuff out, out of the back of their mind, literally and bring it forward so they can begin to really pin down what does have meaning. Mm. I mean, I'd always link that in with conversations around values. The cards are brilliant for helping people think about their values as well. Mm. Okay, I hope so, that answers the question. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully that, that answers the, the question, Ivy. I can see that you're saying you've got a connect group for students. Yes, okay. Um, so I think what you're saying, Pete, is that it, it is about using the cards to drive the conversation rather than us using our assumptions mm. and our judgments to yeah. so people are pulled by yeah. that. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I've experimented with these in lots of ways. Um, 
at, at conferences, I've just taken a table in the hallway and I've just spread the cards out on the table with nothing else. And it's amazing how people just come forward and pick them up and they start generating conversations um, mm. and interest. Um, I, it's hard for me to say this, but if, if trust the process, you know, um, mm. because you'll get you'll get something from it. You might not get what you expect, but you'll get something from it. <laughs> but it is that uh, sort of natural evolution that is the beauty of it, I think, is what you're saying. It's allowing, allowing mm. that process just to happen. Yeah. Mm. I mean, if we think back along the timeline, the cards have not arrived in that way randomly. They've arrived because I've created them in response to coaching conversations mm. that I've had or topics that I feel particularly passionate about that I want to talk about. So there's a there's a link in there, a thematic link around a lot of common coaching conversations and coaching experiences. And it's why I keep adding to them as well. Every time I have a fresh conversation, uh, another card emerges. Goodness knows how big the pack will be when I find them. <laughs> I can see that at Sarah, you've got a question. Please. Um, Pete, I bought the, the minute I saw that they were available on Deck Hive, I bought them, which is a few weeks ago, but I've not used them yet because I knew this session was coming up. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't spotted that there was a question document. So is there, are there, is there a question or a few questions for each of the cards? Is that how it works? No, there's a set of questions. It's a series of coaching the questions, yeah. right? Yeah. Perfect. Lovely. Yeah. That was that one. And yeah. then can I ask a question that's completely unrelated to Pete? Um, I really love behind Bev, the two um, light bulbs. I want to know what they are. I think they're fab. I want to know where, what they are, where I can get them from. So Bev, shall we let you answer that one? <laughs> so um, they were originally, I bought them on the internet. They're just um, decals that you stick on the wall. But I kept them in my cupboard for so long they went sticky. So at the start of lockdown last year, I stuck them on the wall and they fell off. So I stuck them back on and I traced around them and then me and my daughter painted them. So they're actually <laughs> permanently on the wall. <laughs> I, I think they're, they're really, really effective. Uh -huh. um, I haven't got any space on my wall. I'd, I'm going to have to clear something because I really uh -huh. like those. <laughs> Thank Brilliant. you for asking, Sarah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Sarah and Beth. Um, and any other questions at the moment? No. I, I think it's great, Pete, just to hear the diverse range of ways in which you can use the cards and the diverse range of images. Um, and I think we can all see just how you're sort of adding and evolving them as you expand your coaching practice and, and come across new and different uh, mm -hmm. questions and, and situations. Um, so you you were saying that you will be updating them. You're updating the physical cards later in the year and mm -hmm. those uh additions will come onto deck hive as well um yep. so but in the meantime we need to wait for your book by the sounds of it so that's going to come ahead of the cards yeah um it, it, would it be okay just to talk about that for definitely a minute yeah, yeah, or so yeah definitely uh, so it, it's it's it is and it is not a sequel to the art of shouting quietly because the art of shouting quietly was deliberately aimed at introverts and other quiet souls and people didn't read the bit about the other quiet souls. They only saw the word introvert, because, of course, introversion is so front of focus at the moment, uh, thanks to the wonderful Susan Cain and, and her books and her work. And that's great. Um, but the next book is called The Quiet Person's Guide to Getting On in Life and Work, and it's very much aimed at the whole spectrum of quiet. And I don't even like using the word spectrum. It's more of a scattergraph of where people appear with their quiet selves. Because so much of it is contextual. It's too easy to label people um, as introvert or somewhere on a scale of neurodiversity or having ADHD or whatever that drives the quiet along or grief or it's one of many other reasons that people go quiet. Um, labels are reductionist. And I think we use them because they make us feel comfortable. Once we've attached a label to something, we feel that we've probably gone as far as we want to. And we just take the metaphorical box up again and that's sorted. What I'm trying to do is tease all of that out 
and look at the interrelatedness between all of these factors, because someone who's introverted may also have had, you know, early childhood trauma, and the two things come up with similar behaviours. So the trauma creates dissociation, which actually is very similar to a quiet person choosing solitude. And they may not be aware of everything that's going on. So the book kind of unpicks that. But it also examines um, things about quiet from a leaders and managers point of view. You know, if you've got quiet people in the team, how do you work with them to unlock all of that value? You're paying them a full salary and you're getting 50% of the reward from that because you're actually not creating a culture that includes them. And most people's reaction to that is to create a sticking plaster and say, let's train the introverts up in soft skills and get them behaving like extroverts. And that's absolutely not the way to do it. So um, it's, it's, um, it's all about all of that stuff. And that was much more than 30 seconds. <laughs> no, but that's fascinating uh, mm. and sounds like a, a really useful guide. So that's going to be available on Kindle in November. Is that uh, end correct? of November, I'm aiming end for, yeah. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well, I think a lot of us will be uh, looking out for that. Mm. So thank you. Yeah. There is, um, it is also already trailed on LinkedIn. There's, there are articles on LinkedIn about exactly that. Okay. Yeah, so that's the first place to go and look. So if people yeah. uh, sort you out on LinkedIn, then they'll find the links there. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Um, well, thank you, Pete. That's been a really useful insight into the Art of the Possible Cards. I hope everybody else has uh, found that, that useful. Um, and if you haven't found them already on Deck Hive, then please do go and seek them out. And as I said, uh, Pete's saying that the physical cards will be available back end of this year or beginning of next, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so very soon. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, for, yeah, fingers crossed. Um, for any of you who haven't yet um, uh, looked at Deck Hive or haven't seen our latest updates, just to make you aware, so Deck Hive uh, has a broad range of cards available, decks of cards available. Uh, Pete's been one set, um, uh, but lots of others on there as well. So if you go to deckhive.com, you can browse the library and, and look at the decks. Now we're just about to change the way Deck Hive works. Um, currently, you buy decks and then you have sessions that you, you invite guests into and they join you um, uh, exploring and, and using the decks. We're just about to change to a subscription model whereby you will sign up according to your amount of usage uh, each month. You can choose a different package that suits you. But once you've signed up to that subscription, you'll then have access to all of the decks of cards, which will allow you to play with whichever ones uh, you like without needing to buy individual decks. Um, um, so for those of you who are already on the Deck Hive platform, you should have received an email explaining how that's going to work for you personally, if you've already purchased on the platform. Uh, others of you then do look out for the changes, which we're hoping will come live at the back end of next week. So we're keeping our fingers crossed for Thursday next week, um, if all goes well. And from that point, then the subscription will allow you to access all of the, the decks, including uh, Pete. So if you haven't already had a chance to have a look at his, then um, it will become available to you at that point. Um, if anyone has any further questions about Deck Hive, then please just uh, get in touch or go and look on the website. There are lots of support videos and so on there. We have obviously recorded today's session and we will send a link out uh, to that uh, to you and it will be on our YouTube uh, channel along with the other Deck Hive introduces session. So if you've enjoyed this session, then look out for our other ones that are coming up uh, and you can go back to our YouTube channel and uh, view the ones that have already happened. Um, but unless there are, uh, unless there are any uh, last minute questions, then um, thank you very much for coming along. It's been lovely to see you all and uh, we hope to see you at the next session soon. Thank you, Pete. OK, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.